Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to put on my teacher voice. There's a quiz in 10 minutes. See, you're all reaching for your pencils and papers. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to the Fall 2014 Opening Meeting. I'm Margaret Latimer, Vice President and Provost of the Germantown Campus, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here today, although it seems impossible that it was just three months ago that we were here to close an academic year. I want to extend a special welcome to those of you who are new to Montgomery College, and I would like to welcome and introduce our newly appointed trustee, Mr. Carlos Mejijas Ramos, and is Carlos here? I have not seen him this morning. Well, I hope you will get the chance to see. He's here? Where is Carlos? Oh, he's out there. When, when he comes in, we'll applause. <laughs> we'll give him applause. Uh, in addition, I would like to extend a warm Montgomery College welcome to Dr. Gwendolyn Dungy. <laughs> As you saw in Dr. Pollard's remarks, <laughs> Carlos. you missed the fact that we read your resume and extolled your virtues, <laughs> but, but welcome. Um, as you saw in Dr. Pollard's announcement last week, Dr. Dungy is joining Montgomery College to serve as Interim Senior Vice President for Student Services when Dr. Walker Grafia departs for her exciting new position, President of, Mo of Mott Community College. And I also want to express my enormous gratitude to the events staff, the media resources, and MCTV teams, and all who helped to plan not only today's events, but all of the events this week that make this such a rich, full week to return. Thank you all. You are here in Globe Hall, not here, but we are near, and in a year, I look forward to inviting you to another opening meeting in the fabulous new Bioscience Education Center. Thanks to the tireless efforts of the facilities staff, led by Gretchen Rimkus and Kevin Redinger, the IT team, and our lab coordinators and staff, classes will meet in the Bioscience Education Center one week from today. <laughs> We are T minus six days and counting. You may see four tractor trailers full of furniture due today. That's cutting it a little close, and I actually asked Dr. Pollard if we could cancel this meeting and have you all unload tractor trailers. <laughs> you can tell what her answer was. We will celebrate and dedicate this state-of-the-art building on Wednesday, September 10th, and I hope that many of you will be able to attend that event. You can get a sneak preview today. We have staggered tours beginning at 11, meeting in the beautiful foyer. The true dedication is already underway with the preparations for classes and labs. Devoted, dedicated faculty and staff will have a facility that supports cutting edge and innovative pedagogy, student research and entrepreneurial experiences, partnerships with industry, and the opportunity to collaborate with a four-year partner to offer batch a bachelor's degree on the Germantown campus. From the Bioscience Education Center, you can see Holy Cross Germantown Hospital, another remarkable collaboration which will provide endless possibilities for students. The 93-bed facility is the first hospital to be built on a community college campus. There are remarkable things occurring on all of the campuses and throughout workforce development and continuing education. Science West renovations at the Rockville campus, you people just don't stop, do you? <laughs> the reopening of the parking garage at Tacoma Park Silver Spring, repairs completed. <laughs> another, another close call. Um, an inter-campus shuttle between the Rockville and Tacoma Park campuses will be piloted. <laughs> College-wide, the new academic structure went into effect July 1st. And despite a few bumps, I am so inspired by the ideas, the energy, the excitement, and the commitment that you exude. Later in this meeting, you will hear from some very exciting ideas from Tacey Holliday and Samantha Venerusso. 
Nationwide and worldwide, what's going on in higher education is alternately being described as the perfect storm and the wild west. Spiraling costs, the demands to link education to economic development, jobs, and what has become known as destructive technology are changing what we do and how we do it. The astonishing rate at which change is occurring is accelerating. It is a new frontier full of opportunities for students and challenges for us. As some of you know, I joined the administration five years ago after many years in the classroom. At one of the first administrators' meetings that I attended, someone referred to the enterprise. The enterprise is not a term generally used by faculty. And I wondered, could these people be a bunch of Trekkies and they think they're <laughs> driving a starship? Cool. Of course, my lexicon, the lexicon had changed. But last week at a meeting of administrators, the enterprise was again the topic of discussion. And it occurred to me that we are on the starship. We're approaching a new frontier at warp speed, boldly going where no community college has ever gone before, where no college has ever gone before. As we figure out how to navigate this strange new world, we also have to help our students find their way. And that is what everyone in this room does in different ways, but with a common mission on a journey together. And I hope you have a wonderful journey this fall through the new frontier. Before I beam up, I mean invite up the next speaker <laughs> to the bridge, there are, of course, a few announcements. Those attending the AAUP meeting may remain in this room after the program. Staff meetings, uh, the staff meeting is in the Paul Peck Academic Building, room 2059, up on the second floor. The SEIU meeting is located upstairs in this building, room 216, it's right over here. Lunch. This is the important one. Lunch service will begin at 12 noon in the cafeteria in the lower level of the Humanities Building. The schedule for the location of the Senior Vice President's division meetings, please see the back of the, your printed program. And now, it is my pleasure to invite to the bridge to beam up the next speaker, Dr. Sanjay Rai, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. Thank you, uh, Margaret. Uh, I think uh, Margaret uh, deserves a round of applause. Uh, people tell me that for whatever reasons, for the last seven or eight months, great things are happening at the Germantown campus. <laughs> And I think Margaret uh, is, is responsible for many, many of those. Uh, colleagues, uh, good morning. I'm delighted to see everyone here. I had an opportunity to talk to several of you uh, earlier uh, today. I know we are all looking forward to the excitement that the students will be bringing just a week from today when they will be back on our campus. Dr. Pollard, thank you for giving me an opportunity to provide you an update on where we are in, ac in academic affairs and where we still need to go. I think I can speak for the entire college community when I say that we appreciate your leadership, resolve, and driving passion for the college. Colleagues, thank you. On July 1, we implemented a new <clears throat> academic structure. Many of you participated and helped shape the plans. Together, we developed a deep and collective understanding of the complexity of our mission, the challenges, some very exciting opportunities, and imperative to boldly move forward. So much hard work has been done this summer, the CPOD staff developed and delivered an intensive two-week training program for the new department chairs. The Office of Human Resources and Strategic Talent Management, HR STEM, was at work even before July 1 to make many changes the new structure generated. I want to assure you that I had nothing to do with their new name, HR STEM. 
I think, I think Margaret Latimer needs to take responsibility for those things now. <laughs> Central and campus facilities teams and OIT have helped people move to new offices and to create new offices. The budget office completely retooled the budget to align with the new organization. OIT has already worked tirelessly and will continue to collaborate to align the online presence of academic affairs. If students, all of us, will benefit from the update and consistent layouts and pathways. We will rely on continued partnership of our colleagues to administrative and physical services, advancement and community engagement, student services, and of course, the President's office to help us as we continue along our new path. Although the Academic Affairs Division was restructured, you can see that this has truly been a college-wide effort. All divisions of the college are contributing to the successful implementation. I am so thankful for all the support. As we enter our first semester under the new structure, there are many people in the division who have new jobs and many more have newly envisioned jobs, deans, department chairs, administrative aides, all are figuring out the scope of their newly defined positions. I so appreciate their ability to adjust and rise to the challenges that change and progress can bring. As you were just reminded, higher education, in fact, all levels of education are experiencing unprecedented forces of change from internal and external sources. One recent headline read, a cost crisis, changing labor markets, and new technology will turn an old institution on its head. The old institution is higher education. We must be agile and entrepreneurial in our thinking and actions in order to respond to the changing world. We must have structures and procedures in place that allow us to be agile and entrepreneurial. With your help, we have taken a giant step in this direction. In the Academic Affairs Division meetings this afternoon, I will talk about the plan for FY15 to meet the significant goals we have set in place. Our efforts as a division will be guided by a performance matrix that steers our focus 100% toward helping our students to define and achieve their goals. With so much at stake, assessment, holding ourselves accountable to the goals we establish is critical to ensuring that we are moving toward our desired outcomes. To that end, I'll engage faculty and staff from across the college to develop and release a 100-day report to illustrate the achievements and limitations of the new structure. Yes, I know there are limitations. We have already addressed some issues. We will continue to do so in ways that are familiar. We will gather feedback, assess that information, and make changes that continue to streamline and improve our ability to achieve our overarching goals, a student success, a student success, and a student success. Already a doctoral candidate from the University of Michigan's Community College Interdisciplinary Research Forum has visited and interviewed key groups of individuals at the college. About the process that, are, that got us to this point, she will return in November. Her report on the process and current outcomes will be shared with the entire college community. These tools will help us determine what is working in the, initi in the initial rollout and what needs to be adjusted. The academic arm of the college now has a leadership structure that allows for the flexibility and the agility required to meet the challenges 
changing needs of our students and external academic, economic, and legislative environments. This is the most necessary strength in our world today. As Margaret suggested in her comments, the entire spectrum of higher education is in flux. We need to think broadly about the role we play in that movement. So let's shift our attention for a moment to the world beyond Montgomery College. When higher education is described as a global commodity, you know there has been a paradigm shift. When states legislate standards, mandate advising, and put boundaries on degrees, you know that we cannot do business as usual. I want to talk just for a few minutes about what it means for us and for our students to learn and live in a globalized world. Is it possible to develop a borderless curriculum where international partnerships and collaborations are the norm? Visionary people have understood the importance of globalization for a long time. Mahatma Gandhi understood this and achieved global significance and ultimately prominence during a time when travel and communications were far more difficult than today. Despite many invitations, he never visited the United States, but was able to cultivate strong ties with people of the United States. Before Facebook, a boy from Kansas City wrote to Gandhi to find a pen pal. Academics, politicians, religious leaders, and average citizens before Google and email sought information and connections to the man and his ideas. Cole Porter wrote him into a song Brilliantly, in 1942, in a letter to President Franklin Roosevelt, Gandhi leveraged his global reputation and his connections to America to appeal for support for India's independence. The desire for independence was connected to America's pledge to fight to make the world safe for individual freedom and democracy. In his letter to President Roosevelt, he asked him, to do something about the civil rights in the United States. And he writes that in the end, you will have to give civil rights to people in your own country. The students today must develop that foundation, the cultural awareness, and the global perspective that will give them the ability to participate, to thrive in our flattened world. The world offers the students many options. Consider what Starbucks did. They recognized that the vast majority of their employees want to earn a college degree. In a very entrepreneurial move, they are partnering with Arizona State University to meet their employees, employees who want to be students. There is a skill gap in the world, in Maryland, and of course, in Montgomery County. There's a critical need for nurses and those with the skills and knowledge in the cyber workforce. We need excellent teachers. We need licensed and certified professionals in building trades, tax preparers. We need people who can innovate and solve problems. Our understanding of the labor market and our ability and our agility to respond by having programs that prepare students to work in high demand fields requires that we view our mission through a different lens. As with any dynamic enterprise, since we are enterprise, according to Margaret, <laughs> <laughs> the need to identify what to retain and what to change is a, very, is a very real challenge. That is why I asked a group of faculty to transform and restructure the general education program. Some amazing thinking has already gone on. The article that I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks ends with this thought. 
Reinventing an, ins an ancient institution will not be easy, but it does promise better education for many more people. Rarely have, rarely have need and opportunity so neatly come together. The challenge ahead can seem fierce, but I am so excited to be part of this revolution and to be at a place where people are not just thinking about the change, but are taking bold actions. I look forward to working with all of you and having a great year at Montgomery College. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Tacy Holliday and Professor Samantha Vanaruso to the stage. Thank you. We get a slide up there. Is it forward? Uh -huh. Aha, there we go. Good morning. Good morning. Wow. It's so nice to see all of you here and a little intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Pollard has asked us to extend an invitation to you today to talk about the future of higher education, specifically imagining the future of higher education. Dr. Latimer and Dr. Rye have both set the stage for why we need to do this, and we're going to talk about um, an invitation for you to join us and extend that reason why. So you may have noticed that a lot of things have changed around the college the last few years. Just a few things, but some big ones. And it's natural to want to take time to think about what those changes mean for us and to, to process everything that's been taking place. However, as you heard, there's a perfect storm. We must be able to look outward at the same time as we're processing our change. We need to be able to understand that the call of the future is a clarion call to imagine a very different future for higher education. Colleges across the country have to decide how to leverage innovation and how to select the strategies that will best enable them to serve their students in a changing world. Some of the questions institutions are being asked to grapple with include, how might we reduce student costs by 50% or offer a degree for free? What if proficiency, rather than a grade, was the primary currency for academic success? What would it take to offer classes on demand? How might we customize learning support to each student based on data analytics? What if we had to rely primarily on corporate and private funding to do the work of the college? What if we tied tuition to future student earnings? What would it take to reduce seat size, seat, uh, sorry, to reduce seat to seat, to reduce, reduce seat size, FaceTime, by 50% to enable more students to end, attend classes or to accommodate more flexible scheduling? What if community colleges played new roles in helping the community better able to social, better able to respond to social and economic challenges? As you heard from Margaret Latimer and Dr. Rye, many questions are being asked, and these are just some of them. There are plenty of ways that we can make inter inter incremental adjustments to make small changes to address some of these, and we're pretty good at doing that as evidenced by a lot of the things that we're currently doing. But the questions that we're being asked call us to make more systemic changes, to consider the future in different ways, and have the, pos the potential to disrupt the way we do things today and the way we've always done things. Colleges and universities across the nation are responding to these kinds of questions in a variety of ways. Stackable credentials is one option. Um, stackable credentials allow students multiple entry and exit points and bundle courses into discrete packages that directly add up to a degree, but they allow students to come, start, and stop and work in between. For example, in Texas, community colleges across the state 
collaborated with each other and the oil and gas industry to create a set of stackable credentials, beginning with entry-level courses, 9 to 14 credits, that certify the students to have the basic needs for being um, ready to start in the oil and gas industry. Students can continue taking their courses at that time, or they can stop and go to a distant, different institution and continue taking the same degree path somewhere else. It allows them to extend their education over a number of years and, it, and continue to progress in their industry at the same time. The, C, the community colleges are working with four-year schools now to extend that to a four-year credential, not just a two-year credential. Community colleges are also playing a greater role in the community and doing things in the community to support the challenges that communities are facing. An example of that is the, Sac the Sacramento City Hacker Lab. Sierra College um, has partnered with the city. The city established a maker space, a hacker lab. It's a 24 seven um, space that's open and available to anybody in the Sacramento, Sacramento County area. It's funded by business, Sacramento City, and then supported also by Sierra College through material resources and expertise. The lab is a place for entrepreneurship. It's a place for um, trying things out and it funnels students into the college it funnels student, the college funnel, the funnels students back to the school. But it's a, it's a partnership where, it's a hub where the college is one of the community partners. You heard Dr. Rye talk a little bit about things that are happening in Arizona. And another example that's taking place there happens to be Northern Arizona University. I don't know if you've heard about this school. But uh, what they're doing is offering competency-based, fully accredited bachelor's degrees in liberal arts, information technology, and small business administration. They worked specifically with the classroom faculty to look at the competencies for each course, and then they built personalized learning modules around each of these competencies. And students can complete the degree in as little as six months for $2,500. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we share these examples because we know that we can learn from the success of other colleges. And also because we know that other colleges can learn from the many successes that have taken place here at Montgomery College. In fact, Montgomery College is a member of the Strategic Horizon Network, a consortium of community colleges that work together to position community colleges at the forefront of higher education. By engaging in internal dialogue and development, as well as in intentional conversations with member community colleges, each one develops the capabilities to better serve its students and community. And in fact, we are looking for our own answers here. There are many, many people in this room who are engaging in innovation. Last spring, the Faculty Council and the President's Office sponsored an innovation lunch um, with a group of full and part-time faculty to talk about innovation. In addition to hearing about really great ideas that individual faculty are trying out their ha in their classrooms, from applied anthropology to developing open educational resources to other ways that faculty want to explore and try things in new ways, faculty also raised questions like, how do we create faculty externships where faculty can go out and learn the skills of today and bring them back to their classes? How do we seamlessly bring in industry expertise into our classrooms to expose our students to the skills and content that they need today and tomorrow and next year? How do we integrate WDC and E students more seamlessly into the college? How do we let them move seamlessly back and forth and make them part of the college experience more centrally? How can we provide more support for students' lives to give them more access to college? How can part-time faculty better offer their expertise to students at the college beyond the individual classroom? In addition, there are a number of initiatives that reflect systemic innovation, from di digital portfolios, badging, the use of starfish, the development of makerspaces, to sustainable construction. We are on the right path. It is clear there are innovative things happening across this college. We are a staff and faculty composed of excellent, creative, compassionate, passionate, caring people. 
But we have to raise the question of how do we support innovation systemically and how do we do big innovation? How do we do it collaboratively and cohesively? How do we have the space to try and fail? How do we create the space to imagine? Over the last year, Professor Van Russo and I, along with a wonderful steering committee and staff and faculty really and administrators too numerous to name, have been working on Montgomery College Innovation Works. Montgomery College Innovation Works is an integrated think and do tank designed to explore innovation in higher education, to celebrate the innovation taking place here, and to help us leverage those successes to think more imaginatively and creatively and globally about what our community truly needs. The questions that you're going to hear being talked about this year, and you saw some of the work from the administrators retreat in the forum out there, are what do 21st century students need? What do 21st century students in this county need? And what can Montgomery College uniquely and brilliantly provide in 2020, 2030, and beyond? The future is ours if we answer the call. If we ask the, answer the questions, how can we, how might we, might we, what if, and we take the, t the opportunity to challenge ourselves and to take risks, we can do this and we can do this together. We hope you'll join us this year for some of the initiatives we have planned, like the Innovation Think Tank, the President's Innovation Forums, future faculty and staff innovation lunches, innovation talks, and the Reflections Journal. You'll hear more about all of that as the year progresses. So just a quick thank you, although they deserve a long thank you, to the members of the Innovation Work Steering Committee. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce the president of the college, Dr. Darian Pollard. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So the problem with tweeting is that you have to be able to type. And that whole typing thing was kind of messing me up. I'm trying to tweet while Samantha and Tacey were offering their wonderful presentation. So I hope that each of you take the opportunity to follow uh, them on Twitter, but also me, because it's a great way uh, to keep in contact. And I'll, we'll, we'll revisit that concept in a moment. But good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Now, I kind of feel like Samantha because if you haven't stood in this space before and look at you all, y'all are beautiful. I mean, really, you are absolutely stunning. Look at yourselves. Look at yourself. I'm serious. I, I, I feel like I should like bust into a song or something like, you know, you are so beautiful to me or something. <laughs> Because you all absolutely look stunning as a group, and you also reflect, I think, the diversity of this community in so many rich ways. I probably should also maybe break into old anxiety or something like that, because this is the beginning of a new academic year. It's the opportunity when we say goodbye to yesterday, and we say hello to new beginnings, as we do in an academic community. But we also celebrate. And that is indeed what I'm here today to do. I want to celebrate your return, and I toast you um, because it is so good to see you. And a few of you I have never seen before in my entire life <laughs> because you are new to Montgomery College. Um, so I want to extend a very special welcome to you. And if I had a glass of champagne, maybe next year we should serve faux mimosas or something. <laughs> I got a few fans right there. All right, all right. Fo we, might, we might talk about that, Miss Susan. All right, full mimosas. Um, to all of our faculty, our staff, our administrators who are new to Montgomery College, welcome from the deepest parts of who I am. It is so happy to have you as a part of this organization. Welcome to your family. Welcome to our family. Welcome to your journey. And thank you for choosing Montgomery College. Now this very steamy morning, a few of us who understand this intimately in the hair department will appreciate this. It is a steamy day that's happening right now. And it demands that I say a few words about the weather, if you might 
Um, not the weather here on campus directly, not even the weather in Montgomery County per se. I'm talking about the weather as it relates to what's happening in higher education right now. Uh, the similarity is actually rather startling if you think about it. And those of you who have heard and listened to the threads of the presentations this morning will see some connective fiber that I hope that you uh, will revisit throughout your conversations today and dare I say throughout the academic year. Uh, in higher education, the storm clouds are on the horizon. We see lightning in the distance and a few of us may hear the thunder as we listen very closely. If anything, Things have been a little bit more uh, dramatic in the last several years in higher education. More lightning and more thunder in higher education than I arrived uh, since I arrived here at Montgomery College four years ago. Then is now the turbulence appears on the education radar, and then is now the forecasts and advisories, watches. They tell us several things are amiss, and they're things that we need to think deeply about. But with this knowledge of that today, I stand here in front of you fortified by the same attitude that I brought to this organization. Now, just in my earliest days, I take refuge in the NOAA principle. Yeah, the NOAA principle. The NOAA principle states that there will be no more prizes for predicting rain. There will be prizes only for building arcs. No more prizes for predicting the rain, only prizes for building arcs. For the past four years, you and I have lived by that principle. We have been building an arc. Together, we were architects. We were carpenters. And even a few clouds rolled in and we never wavered. We never slowed our pursuit of a new endeavor, this new structure, that would bring and house our students, strengthen our college, serve our community, and elevate our performance, more importantly, priming us for the future of this organization and preserve the ideals at the heart of our heritage. We hung in there. Dare I say, you hung in there. At times, you felt frightened. At times, a few of you got a little angry. <laughs> At times, you felt vulnerable, but here's the secret, so did I. But today, while the arc we have been building is not complete, it is strong and it is enduring. It is enduring because you endured as a college community. Now, some might say that we made this progress despite feeling vulnerable. That is wrong. I'd offer to you that we made this progress because we were feeling vulnerable, just like Noah. It is the vulnerable who know that when our strength is being tested, our strength grows. It is the vulnerable who know that fear is the fear, excuse me, the fear of failure is the ally of failure. It is the vulnerable who know that discomfort inspires innovation and that taking great risk endows us with the courage to be. The courage to be ourselves, the courage to stand tall and walk through with pride, dare I say even bravery, during the deepest and darkest storms. I want Montgomery College to be a vulnerable institution where there is no shame in being wrong and where those who try may try hard and fail, but feel no blame in that failure. I want the pursuit of lofty goals to, gain, to count for more than the comfort of established orthodoxy. I want us to be courageous. And I have to tell you that we're getting there. As I said earlier, we have been master carpenters and ingenious architects, but don't take my word for it. Let me give you some proof. Here's a minute from a video that I did on our lovely campus conversations in my earliest days here at Montgomery College. Pay attention to the goals that I set forth for the first five years of my presidency.
Now, what about looking five years down the round, yeah. road? You've been president for five years. You're looking back. How do you think you will have changed, the college will have changed? What will five years down the road look like? One of the things we talked about is this idea of how words have meaning and, um, and to know someone. You know, you th in the biblical sense, to know someone means you know them on an intimate basis. I'd like to be able to say that I know this college and this community on an intimate basis because I understand what we're doing and how we do what we do. I think the college would be better prepared financially. I think that we'll have a fiscal plan. Will it be a plan that's going to say we're going to continue to do things the way we have been doing? No. But I think we'll have a plan that people will feel that they're a part of. As as a matter of fact, we'll have a new strategic plan for the college that positions us for the future that's going to ask very sincere questions about how we execute the type of work we want to do. Um, I would also say that we have repositioned students as the center of everything that we do. And I'm not saying that we've completely put them to the side, but I think in the moment of these challenges we have now, it's a lot easier to talk about how this is affecting us versus how it's affecting our students. Yeah, me. So I, I'd like to spend some time making sure that, you know, we reverse the dialogue and make sure that we're talking about students. I think the other thing for me in five years, I want to say that we've made, um, progress as an organization in meeting this completion agenda, that we have recognized that we are positioned uniquely for the future, and that we're being recognized for that, both by our county, by our state, and our national bodies. That to me would be saying that we've done something good. So I would hope that you would notice that we've achieved several parts of the things that I talked about or are making steady progress in doing so. Let me go through them. First of all, I told you that I wanted to know this community. I'd offer to you that I know you. I know this institution intimately because you have been my mentors. You have taught me about Montgomery College and even when we didn't see eye to eye, you express your views with kindness and civility in most cases, and respect <laughs> that have become the hallmark of Montgomery College. And I thank you for the education that you have given me. It was because of your mentoring skills that I recognized the imperative to make several administrative changes that have given us stability and sustainability as an organization. And these changes have been broad, and I know that. So let me drive home one fundamental point. There'll be several points I hope I make that are worth listening to, but this one you might want to catch on to. When we're called upon to make transformative innovation and improvement at this organization, I will never, ever choose an easy path of placidity and calm, even if I know that rejecting this route will bring short-term disruption and discomfort. I will always choose long-term progress over short-term comfort. I will always choose that. On to the second goal that I mentioned in my interview, a new financial structure, a fresh fiscal environment. The dramatic, very dramatic uh, fiscal crisis that we all remember too well changed our world. In fact, the year that I arrived, the college employees, including myself, which was a little surprised when I walked in the door, were being furloughed. <laughs> I still remember that. Dr. Pollard, <laughs> everybody's on furlough. Are you going to take this too? I'm like, well, I don't know how exactly I don't do that. So yes, we are being furloughed. And those were rough times. Uh, for three consecutive years, four for our administrators, salaries we were frozen. And I know that this was hard for you and your families. I remember hearing stories as I sat in open forums and talked with various employee groups. But today, four years later, I can tell you that with improving economy, we are making great strides. I am deeply proud of our efforts, your efforts. In fact, that we were able to uh, earn increase $20 million to our base budget from our county this year. These funds will help revitalize and reestablish our mission here at the organization to serve students, and they enable us at long last to implement salary improvements that are richly deserved and long overdue. Y'all should be clapping for that one. The third goal that I mentioned four years ago was that we would make students the vital center of our enterprise. 
I really want to thank my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Beverly Walker Graffia, for her leadership in deepening our institutional capacity for student-centeredness. She may be leaving us this week, and I'm not going to even go there because she knows how much I love and adore her, so congratulations, Beverly, the president of Mock Community College. Under her leadership, <clears throat> Under her leadership, you developed the common student experience. This was already at the core of who we are and what we do as an institution, but it is now articulated as a commitment to our students. It is a promise that we shall not break. Indeed, it is a sacred trust to our students. Finally, in my 2010 Campus Conversations interview, I cited the goal of becoming a transformed institution that will receive recognition locally, nationally, and regionally. Colleges, indeed all organizations for that matter, are like living organisms. They change and they grow and they're malleable. Their form is not constant. And it's my firm conviction that when the form of an organization is right, the functions will flow from that. This is the rationale for our firm focus on form during my first four years as president of this organization. The impact of this formative work is now evident in functional improvement. We now have a vibrant student services division, thanks to Dr. Beverly and every single faculty and staff member of our student services area. We have an academic affairs division now designed to strengthen student success and make the ideal of one Montgomery College a actual reality. Thanks to Dr. Sanjay Rai and every single faculty and staff member in academic affairs. The administrative and fiscal services division is adapting to an ever increasing business and operational demand and dare I say complexity. And I'd like to thank Dr. Janet Warmack and every single member of AFS for making that happen. And the Advancement and Community Engagement Division is deepening our community connections and will continue to evolve as they also advance the name, brand, and philanthropy of this institution in the community that we serve. And I thank you, David Sears, and every member of ACE for the work that you do in that regard. And the group reporting to me in the president's office, led by my chief of staff, Dr. Steve Kane, they're doing great work with more things to come. And I thank you for what you do every day. Everywhere we look, we see that formative change fuels functional efficiency. And now, more than ever before, our institution is intelligently, intellectually agile, primed to meet both today's imperatives and tomorrow's challenges. Last year brought great strides forward in that regard. In addition to our work in academic affairs, I took the recommendation of the Employee Engagement Advisory Group and invited a thorough external review of both Student Services Division and the Administrative and Fiscal Services areas of the college. I did the same with my own office in the presidency. By June, I had analyzed the results of these reviews, and I took action to ensure stability and sustainability as an organization. I announced some of those changes, uh, actually all of them, in the form to the infrastructure of our college, some minor and some major. I shared those, divisions with you, those decisions with you in a memo, and the three senior vice presidents followed up with memos of their own. Those were all community in the same day. Now, I know a few of you said you felt a tad overwhelmed that day with all of the communications that came forth, but I chose to be forthright. I chose to be decisive, and I chose to be transparent. I chose to count on your strength, and I put my faith in your capacity as an organization to absorb the shake, rattle, and roll of formative evolution. At that time, and as so many times in the past, you proved me right. You proved that while change may unsettle us for a moment, it cannot diminish your strength, 
and it cannot dilute your commitment to our students and to our mission. So let me put this in some nitty gritty terms. Y'all are rock stars. <laughs> you are. And I am your biggest fan. I think that as a college, we are a strong organization across the entire institution. New institutional forms responsive to new educational realities. We are now ready for a world of changing challenges and challenging changes many of the ones that were alluded to by the speakers who spoke before me, we have earned the right to move forward with our lofty expectations. We are already meeting these lofty expectations. We are leaving a mark on the world of higher education. Last spring, we were named to the list of community colleges eligible to apply for the 2015 Aspirin Prize for Community College Excellence. I don't know if some of y'all know how big a deal this is, but this is a big deal. <laughs> Just to be invited to apply for the $1 million prize is an honor. Last year, Dr. Gregory Wall was named Maryland Professor of the Year and was featured in a glowing commentary in the Chronicle of Higher Education that shadowed him in his developmental reading and writing class. What's so impressive is that a Montgomery College faculty member has received that same award seven in the last 10 years. Can you believe that? Dr. Wall joins colleagues Professor Don Avery, Professor Susan Bontons, Dr. Mary Fergal, Professor and now Dean John Hammond, Professor Joe Nake, and Dr. Deborah Stearns as recipients of this honor. In addition, last year, Professor Emily, bless you, Emily Rosado was named Individual of the Year in Higher Education by the Maryland Distance Education uh, Learning Association and she was one of four national finalists for the American Association of Community Colleges 2014 Faculty Innovation Award for her groundbreaking work in creating a massive open online course, or MOOC as we like to call it. Yeah, that deserves a class. <laughs> and another innovative program, Boys to Men, was recognized with a gift from a national foundation to accelerate our success in the education of African-American men. <clears throat> I could go on with many more examples of innovation, dedication, and excellence by our wonderful faculty and staff because you are truly outstanding. Four years after that interview that I did in October of 2010, we are on the move, and the movement is steeply upwards. Despite the threatening weather, we did not falter. The clouds did not darken our vision. Excuse me. <clears throat> Most of all, the deafening thunder never stopped us from listening to each other and hearing each other. Now, I will offer, though, that there was only one concession that I made to the wind and the rain, and that would be through my hair. <laughs> Take a look. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> So I don't know about y'all, but I, I kind of think that girl's got a lot of courage, just for the record. <laughs> um, I may not have the best hairstyle judgment from time to time, but because there's a few that are missed, and I think MCTV was being kind, because there was the, the ponytail phase. There was the I don't know what I was doing phase. There was even the whole part where I'm trying to decide am I going to let it grow or not grow. So we, we see how that's going. But let me return to that topic in a very serious way, because there is a period of vulnerability in there. Uh, my thoughts on vulnerability grew out of my reading of Brene Brown's book called Daring Greatly. Thank you, Ms. Carroll, for lending that to me. 
Uh, it blew my mind, quite frankly, and it has the same impact in a million other readers. In fact, Brown's TED Talk on vulnerability has drawn more than 16 million views. I'd encourage you to read it. Great 19 minutes you have. The central thesis that Brown draws forth is that if we expect to be authentic individuals, if we expect to be focused and mindful and primed for personal growth, we must shed our cocoon of invulnerability. We must never keep our mouths shut out of fear that what comes out of it may be dismissed as foolish. We must allow ourselves to be flawed individuals. This will be uncomfortable. It might, at least initially, be terrifying. But the end result means that it will be liberating. Embracing our vulnerability frees us from shame. It frees us from fear of disproving gazes. And I'm soon going to find out all about this. I'm about to put it on the line, if you don't mind. Next Saturday, I'm going to be entering a Dirty Girl 5K. <laughs> yeah, a program that benefits breast cancer awareness and research. And I'm proud to do this. But I have to tell you a little secret again. Becoming a dirty girl exposes a lot of my own vulnerabilities. You want, run through the mud in this. You go through some muck. You swing on ropes and you climb up walls. It is exactly what I am not meant to be. <laughs> I hate being sweaty. In fact, I'm not quite sure that you should be doing sweat in public. That's just my own personal opinion. <laughs> and the thought of being mud cover is about to send me over the edge. Um, but I have to tell you, I'm doing it. Um, I have to tell you that the idea of scaling a wall and climbing under a, something in the mud is something that makes me very frightened to a certain extent. But this is exactly why I'm doing it. With this decision, I'm not only listening to Brene Brown's advice, I'm listening to that of my daddy. Um, recognizing a, a couple months ago that I was going through as he would call a season of personal growth, he gave me a book called Life's Little Instructions, and in that he added 20 of his own instructions <laughs> that he's given me. The last one, actually, in the book says a 512, call your mother. He scratched it out, call your father. <laughs> But he added 20 of these own nuggets. I won't share them all with you, but I'll share a few, and maybe over the course of the year, I'll share more. Uh, number one, amaze yourself, Darian. Keep being who you truly are, and all else will follow. Once in a while, shift gears just for the heck of it. I have one very smart daddy. And because of him, I'm about to become a very dirty girl for a very <laughs> good cause. I know it's kind of funny to all the fathers in the room, right? <laughs> I want the risk, though. I want to confront and let others witness my confrontation of my own vulnerabilities. Because of those vulnerabilities as a part of who I am, and to fear vulnerability is to fear myself. And I simply just don't do that well. On the obstacle course, I will practice the kind of openness that I strive to do in my presidency here at Montgomery College and what I try to do every single hour. And that's going to be to make myself vulnerable, to expose myself, to try something new, to step out of my comfort zone in fact, I'm looking at this 5K as a part of my personal leadership development training. And maybe next year, I'll join Samantha and Vicki going across the bridge in the 7K. Is that what that one is? That one's kind of sending me over the edge, though. So we're going <laughs> to stick with that. But what does all of this really mean? Me getting all muddy and sweaty and dirty and probably failing miserably? What does this have to do with my conviction that Montgomery College must be a vulnerable institution? Let me borrow from some of the CEOs and organizational specialists who've embraced Bre Brene Brown's ideas. They tell us that in organizations that encourage vulnerability, the workplace becomes a place 
that is free of shame and fear. They say that organizations that focus on minimizing mistakes inevitably end up minimizing innovation. They say that organizations flourish when they move toward the quote, the normalizing of discomfort. Dr. Brene Brown teaches us that a culture of vulnerability is a culture of trust. It welcomes people who rock the boat, or perhaps rock the ark. It welcomes wild ideas and far-fetched speculation. It welcomes disagreement. And to repeat, this is a culture that is free of shame and free of blame. We have the foundation of a culture of trust with our dedication to participatory governance. Participatory governance is a statement that everyone should have a seat at the table. Participatory government is, above all, a statement that we need each other. Here at Montgomery College, we never want to be like those two guys that are out fishing in the middle of a, a sea or a lake or a pond on a little rowboat. And the boat starts to take on water. And you start to see it build up and then more water and more. And then the one guy looks at the other guy and says, your end is sinking. <laughs> That's not us. That's not Montgomery College. We are one college. We are all in the same boat. We are in the same arc, and we need each other. We trust each other, and we need that trust to flourish. When this culture of trust becomes a reality, creativity flourishes. Innovation takes flight. Mistakes will likely multiply. Y'all catch that? Mistakes will multiply. But as mistakes multiply, solutions multiply faster. That is why I want Montgomery College to be vulnerable. The challenges confronting us will take all the creativity that we can muster, all the courage that we have as an organization, because the times are real. They are real. Let me outline four challenges that we face this year and the coming year. One is called the achievement gap. African American and Latino students are not completing and graduating at the same rate as their white and Asian peers. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. By the way, I have to tell you, I want to change the name. Achievement gap, I feel some kind of way about that. Last year, uh, one of our H's, ACES coaches inspired me when I heard in her interview, someone asked her, how do you feel about working with at-risk students? And she made the statement, they're not at risk, they're at promise. Ooh, y'all had a moment too? <laughs> I had a moment, that keeps me up, so I keep thinking achievement gap, that kinda don't sit right with me because it places the blame in ways that I don't think are very real, so I'm challenging. Dr. Brown, Dr. Rivera, who are leading our Achievement Gap Task Force. I'd love to figure out a different name for this work. Particularly, and I wasn't going to say it, but I got to say it, given the stuff that's happened in this country right now, hmm. I got a little brown boy at home. And I don't know about you. And I'm trying to figure out how to explain a few things to him. I don't want to have to explain to him that other little brown boys and girls at Montgomery College are not successful. I need you to help them. I need you, plain and simple. <laughs> yeah. Whatever we eventually call it, this issue is stubborn and it has deep roots and it has multiple causes, but we can work 
harder at Montgomery College to eradicate it. This will require a tighter alliance between our college and our good friends at the Montgomery County Public Schools and our community leaders. It will require relentless advocacy for better pre-K programming, better health and nutrition programs for young people, better outreach to families. It will require meeting the demands of college readiness standards. Park is here, is not going nowhere. The Common Core is here. We will be at the center of all of this through programs like ACEs and so many things we have going on here at Montgomery College. We will be tackling and taking on, and dare I say, you know, the south side of Chicago comes out of me, we're going to have to make it go someplace else. It doesn't belong in Montgomery County. Number two, risk management. We must recognize and act on the recognition that the demand for transparency and accountability in higher education has never been more intense. Effective and aggressive enterprise risk management has never been more essential. By that, I mean that we must keep our eye on everything from prudent stewardship of the resources that have been asked and given of us, <clears throat> to dedicated oversight of our physical plant and infrastructure, from information technology to campus security, from Title IV federal financial aid to Title IX and fair treatment and equity. Once again, this will require work of all of us together. Enterprise risk management is a whole college responsibility. Number three, destination employer. The phrase destination employer describes one of our highest aspirations. Montgomery College is a great place to work. We know this. Now everyone else must know about this as well. To become a destination employer of the highest order, we must all be ambassadors of goodwill for Montgomery College. Whether in casual conversations with friends and neighbors or in more formal settings with our county leaders, let's set forth this word. If you want to improve Montgomery County, come work for Montgomery College. If you want to advance the cause of social justice, come work at Montgomery College. And I must add this one. If you want to work in an environment of innovation and trust, come to Montgomery College. This, too, is a whole college responsibility. We must all act as one big public relations firm about this institution. Number four, and you heard us talk about this earlier, and thank you, Dr. Rye, for your comments, academic restructuring requires all of our support. This is a historic moment for Montgomery College, but the times demand it because these are no ordinary times. Threats to higher education abound from everywhere, from those who would elevate the profit motive above student learning and student well-being, from those who believe that we can educate the best and forget about the rest, for those who mock President Obama when he says that community colleges can determine the fate of our economy and the destiny of our democracy. You will note very clearly about the goals that I just set forth. None are cosmetic, none of them. <laughs> in fact, we don't have time to just be caught up in superficial cosmetic change anymore. The reality is that the times are significant. We cannot tinker with the edges of the status quo we must transform. There is no, hy no hyperbole, none at all in the statement that the choice before us is between bold, visionary change and slow, steady decline. The choice is ours. We can be agents of change or we can be the victims of change. And just so you know, I don't do the victim mentality very well. 
So let me assure you this, we are not approaching the status quo carrying explosives though, all right? Let me give you a point, especially emphasizing an article I read in Harvard Business Review. It says, transformation is an era, not an event. Transformational change is deliberative change. It is fueled by thoughtfulness, not impulsiveness. It takes time. It takes a balance between the fierce urgency of now and the sluggish persistence of then. We will not transform Montgomery College overnight. History tells us this over and over again. Think of it. The time that elapsed between the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation and the passage of the Civil Rights Act that gave reality to that proclamation was 101 years. But let's come up to more modern times when everything supposedly happens at the speed of light. Most have heard of the late Steve Jobs in his second helm at Apple turned the organization around. Now some think that Steve Jobs walked right in, threw out some ideas, hired some new talent, and whoop de doo Apple was a new company. It was transformed. But the facts are more compelling if you think about this. Jobs returned to lead Apple in 1997, and it wasn't until about 2007 that people started noticing a big turnaround at Apple. 10 years. Now that's fast. Yeah, that's fast. As I began my fifth year as your president at Montgomery College, as I think of this era of transformation that I'm a part of, I'm reminded of one of my favorite quotations. After an especially important victory in a battle during World War II, excited reporters asked Winston Churchill just how momentous this victory was. And Churchill answered one of his, in one of his famous radio addresses talking about the victory. He said, quote, this is not the end. This is not the beginning of the end, but this is the end of the beginning. That's how I feel today. We are at the end of the beginning. There is a long road ahead of us as an organization, and the stakes are high. But we know now what needs to be done. We know that when our strength is challenged, our strength grows. We know that we are one college, and we know that we need each other to survive. So let's put the finishing touches on what we have come to accomplish here on our arc. Let's launch our journey. Let us persevere as an organization so that all who come after us, and that's an important point, getting caught up in this moment, this is one space and one time, but there are people who will be coming after us. We want them to say that those were people of strength. Those were people of courage. Those were people deeply dedicated to America's students, to social justice, and to the highest standards of educational excellence. Let them say that they were willing to be vulnerable. Let them say that they were courageous beyond measure. So let's go on with our challenging work and dare I say, let us make Noah proud. Thank you all very, very much. try something new and it's going to require us to be vulnerable again. Can y'all help me out? I got a couple minutes. So y'all know we've been through a couple changes as it relates to how we introduce employees, right? So I'm listening to you in the first year. You all made a couple comments about the fact that we put everybody's name who has started within the organization in the last year on the screen. And then the following year, I think that we read everyone's name. Where's Dr. Kane? He's still my hero for that. Read everybody's name 
who started within the last year. So I'm going to try something a little different because I think that if we are to become a destination employer, one of the things that's important about everybody is that we give everybody a voice. We also should try and see everybody as well. I want to put my eyes on you, and I want to welcome you to Montgomery College. So I to incent you in that, I have a little gift as well. So if you are a new Montgomery College employee, pause for one second, having started since when? July 1st, 2013, in the last year. Ah, gotcha, in the last year. I'm asking you in a few minutes to come forward and receive a little token from me and also to shake my hand so I can tell you welcome to Montgomery College and stay up here because I want to start a new tradition. I want to take a picture. Ah! <clears throat> and I challenge you because this is an easy spot for those of us to leave to leave. I would encourage you to remember that you were new one time too. And I remember being new at the first college I was at. And that's a whole nother story. So if you are a new employee who started the college since July 1st, 2013, would you please come forward? Oh, there's so many people, Denise. 